Artist Jay O'Neill joins me in studio to talk art, inspiration, and that thin line between the dark side of marketing and sharing ourselves with the public. We also get a no-nonsense, deep-dive look into Jay's newest invention, Nonsensico Digest. The conversation begins in 4, 3, 2, Hello art enthusiasts and art lovers, welcome to episode 5 of Art Wonderful, the art podcast where art is a religion. I'm your host, Nicholas Harper. I'm broadcasting from my art studio deep within the Rogue Buddha Gallery that's in the heart of the Northeast Arts District in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank you for joining me as we explore everything the arts have to offer. It's the mission of this podcast to spread the gospel of the arts, their essential value to our everyday lives, and to offer a deep dive exploration into this, a most mysterious of subjects. You can learn more about myself, the Rogue Buddha Gallery, this podcast, and those we have on the show by visiting us online at roguebuddha.com. Click podcast from the menu. And be sure to listen to the end of this and every episode, as I'll be sharing my pick of what art event you simply can't miss this weekend, should you find yourself in our neck of the woods, here in the Twin Cities. This is brought to you by our amazing partner, we art enthusiasts simply can't live without, mplsart.com. In this episode, I was honored to be joined in studio by a great artist and friend, Jay O'Neill. What you'll hear is what I hope to be only the first of many conversations between the two of us, as we often get together and banter all things art and life. By way of a bit of housekeeping, you may notice a few references that indicate not only that this conversation was actually recorded prior to the third and fourth episode, but that Art Wonderful wasn't the original name I had picked out for this podcast. I was going to name it Rogue Buddhism. And as such, you'll hear that name mentioned a few times. Ultimately, I decided against this name, as I was already using it for a blog that I hardly ever update. That is, until now, as I'll be updating it on the regular once again here shortly. But also, I didn't want to confuse the podosphere into thinking that this podcast was about Buddhism, which of course, it is not. With that said, and with no further ado, let's get into the conversation. I'm joined in studio today with a very special guest, a good friend of mine and fellow artist, Jay O'Neill, a.k.a. Boxy Mouse, a.k.a. Boxy Manufacturing, a.k.a. Yeah. Nonsensico, yeah. a.k.a. Yeah. Wait for it. Po- uh, Sticker Envy, All a.k.a. Yeah. Scrapeboards, yeah. a.k.a. Pocket Octopus. Totally. And, uh, AKA one of the hardest working artists I know. Did I miss any AKAs, Jay? Uh, they're all in different forms right now. Yeah, that's probably about right. Uh, as I mentioned in the first episode, I would be joined hopefully on a regular basis by Jay O'Neill, as I am tonight, and that with any luck, he would bring me back down to earth after I spout my highfalutin ideas and ideals where the arts are concerned. Uh. You falute with the best of them. <laughs> Hi, falutin. Hi, falutin. Uh, there's been many a Friday night deep in the bowels of the Rogue Buddha Gallery where Jay and I have conversed and dug deep on many of varying issues. If these conversations are anything like those of the past, well, we're about to go deep into the trenches. No pressure, Jay, but let's make this the best podcast episode ever recorded. Oh. Yeah, no pressure. Yeah. The, the conversations we had off mic were pretty good. Let's if we can hope we can bring it here. Well, we thought they were pretty good. Oh, that's true. Yeah. We'll find out, I guess. That's relative. Thanks for being here. Um, so, kind of the premise of what I thought our conversations would revolve around to begin with would be, uh, on a monthly basis, I'm going to be doing some episodes where I just uh, talk about a specific issue or idea within the arts. Um, or some of my experiences within the also other episodes will have interviews and I thought we'd bring you in for conversations to uh, kind of bring a level head to some of the ideas and topics being discussed and 
offer a different perspective so I'm not just in here by myself. Yeah. Some people would call it a level head. <laughs> I'd call it a, a dissenting cynical head. All right. That's what I would call it sometimes. That works. Which is very strange for me to be the idealist in this relationship, but that seems like the way it's gone lately sometimes. So, Well, and for this first episode, my idea was, <clears throat> because I've recorded the first two episodes already, my idea was to have you listen to those episodes so that here today you'd be able to uh, comment on them. But... And that's something I didn't do. No. No. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Not at all. That didn't happen. You don't care enough. That's okay. That's okay. I think I care a lot. <laughs> Just not about this. No, no. <laughs> uh, next time I'll listen, I swear. It's kind of like the homework you promised to do. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. So, I'm just going to... Uh, I will listen in the future, though. This was a, kind of a last minute thing for today, so... Yeah, no. We'll no, make it this work. This was spur of the moment. Yep. By, yeah, so uh, for the listeners, it might be a little bit different than future episodes, but then again, future episodes... Who knows what they might be? You We're might not started. even hear this one at all. <laughs> well, then that's true. <laughs> this might be the last episode. Right. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this three-episode run of four-episode <laughs> run as we wrap things up. <laughs> this has been I'd Rogue like Buddhism. To, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and participating in your podcast while it was lasting. And, <sighs> and I'm sorry I was the one who caused its demise, but... We had a good run. We did. We had a good run. We'll just have to keep on doing them without a microphone. Kidding. <laughs> or I think we should have a, just start a new podcast every week and just do one episode right. per each podcast. Right. And they all can reference each other. Totally. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Our new podcast network. Yeah. Join us next week as we launch a new podcast entitled... It's self sabotage podcast. <laughs> self sabotage. Well, we can't steal that from that magazine. Yeah, that's true. That, that new no, hot magazine be, that's coming out. Well, they, they could be. They could pair. You could. You could have them be brother and sister vehicles. Self sabotage magazine. Self self sabotage podcast. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Huh. Well, we'll have to. Uh, we'll have to talk to uh, licensing to our licensing department. Okay. Talk to the boys up on fourth yeah, I'll floor. Talk, I'll talk to Knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I do want to bring up a couple of the topics from the first two episodes, but first I kind of want to find out uh, a little bit more about you or introduce you to the people that are listening uh, to this podcast. Who is Jay O'Neill? Um, well, Jay O'Neill is somebody that likes to make things, various things. Um, I've been doing this phase. No, of- I think they get it. I think that's enough information. Okay. Yeah. That's good enough. I think I think we covered it. All right. All right. You're fired. So, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to our next question. If that doesn't paint a picture all right. for I you I like all. to make things. Yeah. My yeah. name's Jay. I make things. Um, so, I've been in this phase for about, uh, I think, around 11 or 12 years. Started out with, with Boxy Mouse. I've been with Boxy Mouse that whole time. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's uh, kind of a pop art, um, part real tame graffiti, part fine art, part product, many different things. Um, it's pretty much... Part philosophy? Part philosophy. There's a lot of that in it too. Uh, for at least those first 10 years, it was pretty much a daily, all the time, grinded out project, Boxy Mouse was. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've gotten interested in a few other things. A couple of them are inspired by Boxy Mouse. Others are completely separate. So I did like this big skateboard campaign. That was kind of its entity unto itself, but Boxy Mouse was intertwined to it. Um, I did this sticker project where I had a bunch of people submit, and we printed stickers and made packs out of them, um, which is kind of becoming a theme these days because the... The latest thing I'm working on is a magazine that is um, has like 13 artists involved. Um, it's a little bit more meaty than some of the other things I've done. A little bit more future looking. So. And what's that called, Jay? It's called Nonsensico Digest, nice. and um, that's kind of what we were joking about before with the self sabotage because it 
nonsensical digest. Uh, it seems like at every turn I'm trying to self sabotage it, but it keeps coming. It keeps coming. It's coming. It's for real. Look for it on newsstands. Never. Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere. No, we got Is the sample the issue out. It it really yeah. does exist now. So um, that's something over the next couple months that's going to keep me real busy, uh, away from my boxy mouse a little bit. But that's okay. I've yeah. actually got a. It's copy really turned of the... into something. It's. It's not what I expected it to be. So, it's, well, it's you wonderful. know what I say about it. It's an object. It is an object. It's an object. I've quoted you saying as such. Yep. No, nope, I've got one in studio here, and uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Thank um, you. You know, I'm a firm believer in the artifact. I'm not a total technological luddite, but I love tangible, physical uh, artifacts. Yeah. So too. having something in print like this is incredible yeah it does seem to getting back to self-sabotage i am taking a hard route having really basically no fan base for the thing and deciding i'm going to make a print magazine is kind of a weird undertaking and it makes sense as everyone's going more digital and online yeah, yeah as go everything print. goes online yeah yeah yeah, um, don't but, look for this on TikTok. That could be the tagline. Yeah, not sense ago, not on and TikTok. You know what? All joking aside, it's um, it's a gr- it it really turned out to be a fine way to use paper. It's, I just love it so much. It's this first issue has turned out great. Um, there's work involved in selling it now. Yeah, which I'm not always the best seller, but I'm getting better with every. Well, we're bigger gonna, idea that I have, so we'll see how this one does. We'll definitely cover that in one of these episodes. What selling out marketing? Oh, marketing. <laughs> selling That's out right. and marketing. That's yeah. right. Most definitely, but you know, I found, my one criticism of the magazine is I found it a little bit too wordy. Yeah. Found it a little bit too heavy on yeah, the. Yeah, uh, I'll take some of those on the words. Twelve words out. That was can, important. Can you describe oh. just kind of what the what the premise of the magazine is? Basically. Uh, <laughs> well-crafted unusual art uh stuff that's not readily understandable unless you're the artist i'm sure every single person in that magazine knows exactly what they're trying to communicate yeah um but it's not easy for the observer to tell what it what it may have been yeah but with examination anyway i don't want to get too much in the philosophy but i think if you look at these images like uh Oh, what's one uh, an image? Uh, oh, I'll, I'll name drop. I may as well name drop. So uh, Buzz Osborne from the Melvins. Yep. He likes to take pictures when he's out on tour. Uh, that's one of his things is photography. So um, so he took a yeah. picture of uh, uh, this cinder block wall with the word, um, the word hell painted on it. And it's, it's funny how such a simple image was striking to me um but you don't know why you don't know why it's striking to you but these fascinating objects that people are yeah. either capturing or making from scratch well i should say you know to go back to the philosophy of the magazine a little bit there really are no words in this magazine it is basically it's a compilation of image oh every yeah page i should have gotten is, into that since that's basically the question you asked um yeah every bit <laughs> um so the first few the first couple pages and the last couple pages are the only place where words are they explain a little bit who's participating a tiny little intro a couple of fake ads that have words in them other than that it's 54 pages of solid imagery yeah, that's brilliant. And it's just, and it's all my favorite stuff. When, when I look through that thing, like literally, this thing shouldn't exist. Um, l- almost literally, everybody the that's a- how I feel that about I the asked, gallery and pretty much everything yeah, I do. Every <laughs> literally every person that I asked said yes. So, including a couple of heroes of mine and um, some local people from Minnesota that are making amazing things that don't fit into a genre per se. Um, I put them all together and they work beautifully together. It's all different mediums. It's all different viewpoints. It's, it's tame. It's, um, it's difficult to look at. It's easy. It's all these things. It's, you'd have to see it. I I hope a lot of people get to 
Oh no, I think podcast is the best way to uh, to sell a magazine. <laughs> to describe yeah. Yeah. art magazine. Well, it's got a cover, right? <laughs> the cover paper is a little heavier than what's going on on the inside. That's the way we do it in the magazine industry. What is that, 120 pounds? Let what me are we describe talking? it. If you really want to know, it's 100 pound cover okay. and then uh, 80, 80 pound pounds? text. Yeah. All right. What's the finish? Uh, Ooh, it's, luster? It's a satin. Satin. Yeah, nice. satin with a gloss coat on the cover. All right. And it's coming in at what uh, standard magazine size? Yeah, it's the same size as Vogue. Okay. <laughs> not, th- not thickness. No, not, not thickness. thickness. But the, um, so you're the, right up there with Vogue. I like this. I'm right there. So picture Vogue. Oh, that's where, <laughs> you know, I like that. Yeah. In fact, I got to write that down for this little spiel I got to do later. <laughs> so picture Vogue. It's just it's like It's kind of like that. <laughs> Paper and this size, kind of like that. That's one of the beautiful things I think about this magazine is that it's called Nonsensico. You're bringing a weird nonsensical, in a way, philosophy to it. Um, but yet everything in it is very sensical in and of itself to each and every artist. Sure. Like, it's not like... I mean, these are pretty high-end pieces of art, and you've got some pretty big names in there. Yeah, Like yeah. you said, Melvin's, you've got uh, Dalek, Jeff yeah. Johnson, uh, John Sauer. Hazel Myers Hazel. in there, too. Yeah, you've got heavy-hitting people in this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's so, it's so this good. weird... It's funny in the pitch, because when, when I'm pitching these people, basically, what am I telling them? I'm like, well, your stuff is nonsense, so I'm interested, you know? <laughs> Total nonsense, guys, but hey, way to go. I yeah. want you in my magazine. You know? Totally. So, um, but it's, to me, personally, nonsense is is a compliment because I think a lot of the best art is nonsense. It's not supposed to be easy. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense at first. Okay, know? now we're getting into the meat of things. Yeah. What's the purpose of art, Jay? Oh man, yeah, I don't know if you're going to get right me there. into that one. Um, the way I use it is yeah. um, is to amuse and delight mm-hmm. and surprise. Um, that's kind of one of my main philosophies. With and, and that overarches that goes into everything I do, whether it's boxy mouse or or this thing or my um, some of my other projects that I work on. It's always about doing a something a little extra that's unexpected and delighting people. And and that's the way I see this magazine happening. It switches up from artist to artist and it's like a discovery. You're discovering it's like, "Oh, you know, this I feel this way about this thing. These group of photos, oh, they all go together and I feel this way." Yeah. Well, then you turn the page and you're onto something completely different. The the looks different, the medium's different. Um the whole approach is different you know like yeah. some people are, are trying to shock you some people are trying to calm you some people are um just being as silly as i am you know what i mean but yeah. it all makes total sense yeah in in a very nonsensical sort of way <laughs> i guess well and i should preface my question by you know bringing it back to the first couple episodes and kind of the premise of this podcast the the tagline of the podcast is uh the art podcast where Uh, art is a religion for me and this is kind of what I laid out in the first episode is that the role of art primarily is a as a window to the soul I kind of take this approach when as the viewer looking at art when a painting or a sculpture or something resonates with something with somebody it's because that it it's resonating with their soul or they're seeing a part of themselves in that object um and so that's why I call it a window to the soul or a soulmate. It's about uh, the core being of that person, their spirit, their soul, mm. um, and how it relates to, you know, I don't know if it's, you want to call it a source or like the grand creative principle is what I refer to it a lot mm. of as. And this is the part where I thought, okay, Jay's going to tear me to, par- to shreds on. There I'm he feeling, goes. I'm feeling gentle up the tonight, f- actually. What's that? I'm feeling pretty gentle tonight. Oh, nice. I might have a couple things to say. but <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, But when you say something delights somebody, like when something delights you, when you see uh, a work of art that delights you, what is it that 
that causes that delight? Like, where's that coming from? Is there something underlying uh, that delight? Uh, unexpected. It's, it's, that's so hard to explain. Um, I don't know where that delight comes from. I, I want to actually, I just had a thought. So the other thing that I think about is it's another way, whether it's stuff that I make mm-hmm. or stuff that I'm showcasing in a magazine, it's a way for me to tell people who I am. Okay. Um, it's a way to communicate. These are the things that I love and I don't always know why I love them, yep. but either here's a collection of these amazing people that make things or here's the things that I make that I that I like that I make it's a way for me to explain this is where I'm coming from yeah you know and whether that's a soul or whether that's a a spiritual thing I don't know about all that yeah but consciously sometimes it's like this is what I'm trying to do like putting this magazine together I mean I I don't want to market it as such but that's basically what it is. Basically, yeah. I'm saying these are the things that I like. This is me. This is part of who I am. Uh, and it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. It's not an easy story. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. well, what is this guy? Why Why is this here? I don't know, but this guy put it. <laughs> this guy put it together. He loved it enough. Why is anything here? I know. Somebody I know. Then you can go down like... the nihilism route, and it's like everything's <laughs> nonsense. And yeah, um, I'm not going quite that far because I love these things. You know. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't dismiss them as actual nonsense at all because they're beautiful to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, because this represents who you are. Is it? You mentioned a second ago that it's hard I'm wondering if it's ever hard because it, is it ever spooky or scary to you know reveal yourself like this well here's the thing that's nice about art is you can hide yourself behind it you don't have to explain too much you know what I mean so I don't know it's veiled okay. you know what I mean it's it's a veiled thing as most art is if um, sure there, there's always a reason why people do things um, and it's not always obvious you know in fact with I've found I've which is why I gravitate to this kind of stuff I think the best stuff is very veiled it's very very personal even if it doesn't seem like it at face value um, that I I, I want to go back to that that photo of buzzes I can imagine him um, being on tour touring around is hard it's a weird grind um and he has this little bit of solace he's looking for things on tour yeah to photograph and he found this wall you know he found this wall on tour this is a moment in his life that he chose to capture and then i get to propagate it i get to push it further you know yeah or further i don't know i mean you get to showcase that moment yeah and some people realize that's what it is and some people won't like uh, like Jeff Johnson putting those thermoses out in the middle of a stream yeah you know you can sense the dedication to this crazy vision this guy had yeah you know what I mean dedicated yeah. that he's not screwing around yeah and he captured this thing that we get to see especially the way you're putting this magazine together it's very much like a curated gallery yep and that's one of the reasons why there's no words for me Mm -hmm. is so these things that I gathered stand on their own yeah you know I'm not peppering them with all my little clever words and descriptions see that we might fight about that kind of stuff a little (laughs) bit but all these clever (laughs) maybe not here we'll be tame this is an introduction to Nick and Nick and Jay on a microphone here um (laughs) But, uh, you know, no interviews, no nothing. There's enough of that. Other magazines are covering that. I, I want to choose things that can stand on their own mm-hmm. in their weirdness, you know? Yeah. You don't say, oh, that's a pretty painting of a f- horse or whatever. There's none of that. Yeah. It's just, here you go. Totally. Digest that. You know what I mean? Totally. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are receptive to it. 
Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating group of stuff. Anyway, this isn't supposed to be an advertisement for. <laughs> Welcome to the Nonsensical Podcast, where we talk about my magazine and try to get money in exchange for it. Well, we were saying this might be the first and last it episode might be, yeah. of yeah, uh, that's right. Rogue Buddhism. Join us next week as we for launch Nonsensical, Nonsensical <laughs> Podcast. That's right. And then you'll be interviewing me. That would be for very that appropriate. One. Totally. So appropriate. For our first and only Nonsensical Podcast. Yep. And then we move on to self sabotage podcast, which totally. is basically we'd cover how Nonsensico torpedoed the Rogue Buddhism <laughs> podcast, and that was self sabotaging. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> to that point, kind of. Um, it's funny that you're delving into print now when everything is so digital. Um, and I'm running an art gallery, and you know, this is actually going to be an episode that I want to cover down the road. But this idea of like, you know, what's the place of brick and mortar, and what's the place of print mm-hmm. in our digital age? And I think, you know, spoiler alert, I think they're more important now than ever uh, because of how digital everything is. You know, we need that tactile, yeah, physical. We like objects. I just was listening to something where people were talking about vinyl you know Mm -hmm. same kind of thing yeah the kids and i don't know if it's a phase but young kids like uh, i think the this person's son was like 12 years old or whatever and they went to this store and they had vinyl and the kid was all about it yeah you know yeah Um, i think it's gonna make a return I think the pendulum's got to come back this way. Yeah. But I think that's why people go back to it is the music of today isn't it doing it for them. Yeah. Like, I think this person that I heard their story, the kid picked up like a, I think it was a Guns N' Roses album, um, maybe Motley Crue, but it was stuff that yeah. I was listening to, which is, again is similar. I was listening to Zeppelin when I was in high school too. So same well, see, thing. Yeah. For me, I was... I was the weird one in my class because I was listening to the Beatles and Zeppelin um, when everyone else was listening to New Kids on the Block. Right. You know, that stuff didn't yep. didn't Judas do it Priest, for me. Just Priest, Deep Purple. Totally. All that stuff. Dio. Yeah. Dio, hell yeah. <laughs> Dio. Hell yeah. Oh, wow. Um, really, the whole Black Sabbath. Everybody that was in Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was good. So there's a deeper point there, I think, too, which also is something that for me validates galleries and um the print magazine is that it creates like i I definitely look at something like instagram as super beneficial for the arts in that it removes gatekeepers and people have access to promoting themselves to large audiences and collectors have access to a wider range of artists more easily which i think is hugely beneficial in one way but i i think that the 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 benefit then that the gallery or a print magazine has is the curation and they present a vision and they they present what they think is quality and craft um craft a vision or craft i agree i felt that the whole time as i was doing not that we'll touch on the magazine one more time yeah because that's i was very conscious of that that's a was, pun is touch was, on the magazine because it's print yeah that's a pun with your hands yeah, your mute touch. Yeah, um, but I was really conscious of that as I was picking people, and like I was, cr- yeah, I was, I was crafting it. Yeah, the rhythm of it. The I want you to see these things in this order. Yeah. Whereas with with your gallery, it's like when you walk in the door, this is what I want you to see first, mm-hmm. if at all exactly. possible. Uh, these things on the side are supporting this thing I'm trying to show you. Yeah. And then you'll make your way around and see the rest of it. This is the introduction to the work, either because it's the best example or it's the most high impact example. So you craft the tone. that. Yeah, you craft that experience. You know what I mean? It's well, I think of I think musically when I install a show, I think of notes very specifically and how I want a song to lead somebody through mm-hmm. a space. You know, when they walk around, I know most people when they come in the front door, they're going to turn right because that's what most people do. In retail situations hmm. that's just so knowing that i know i'm going to start the song on the right that was like a little fact lit you gave me right there it was yeah yeah, yeah. So, you start on the, so you start on the right you start on the right and then you make your way around the room going around counterclockwise mm-hmm. um 
so that's like when you walk into a grocery store like cub you know all the fresh produce is on the right and then the most unfresh stuff is on the far far left wall Hmm. so i craft it thinking musically and i think about notes and progressions and um you know uh crescendos and rests and yep. timing and beats and that sort of thing um i i think a curating a, a gallery show is very artistic in and of itself in art form yep. so mm-hmm. same thing with the magazine yep same thing yeah and music yeah it's it's kind of funny how intertwined that is the music is at least i find it is with me it there's no um, there's no separation almost it's they're, they're together yeah um, I do my best work when I'm listening to music you do listen to music oh absolutely yeah if I don't feel like if I don't feel like uh, spending a couple hours on the canvas or whatever yeah I know what I know what album to put on you know what I mean I know yeah which album's gonna get me into that mode where at least I'm receptive to going down and starting at least and yeah. then after that it's pretty much a done deal it's kind of a funny vision picturing you like making a boxy mouse painting or sticker listening to like judas priest oh it's no it's it's heavier <laughs> than that man <laughs> who is it what are we it's talking about like, uh, comedy christ comedy christ is <laughs> oh, one of the ones seriously? yeah 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 <laughs> um that cracks me up yep and let's see so comedy christ is one um, uh, I think it's everybody hates you. That's yeah the one that really gets things going. Um, yeah, and then oh, see, this is a guilty pleasure. Is um, is uh, a little Rammstein. We were talking about Rammstein. Uh, no, not <laughs> Rammstein, but KMFDM's in there. Yeah. Um. Oh, who else? Oh, Baby Metal. Baby right. Metal is the the Japanese. Like literally, girls? that is the one for me. Yeah. If I put that on, oh. I will start. Oh, like, that's awesome. Yeah, it's weird because it leads off a really great... That album, there, there's one of their albums is great. To me, it's great. Yeah. And it leads off this like four or five album mix that I have. So I know wow. that I'm good for like three hours. Wow. Okay. problem with them is, is I don't like their new stuff. Yeah. And they... Oh, see, we're going to start talking about Baby Metal? <laughs> um, they, they had a thing like Menudo for a while where oh, they had revolving members yep yep okay. so you, you, after a certain age i think it was like 16 they um, were out they were out they changed that because one of them was so popular that it couldn't you know yeah this sue metal i think is her name okay. and um i think she was on this tour but just i don't like the direction they went it's funny <laughs> I don't. There's that one album for me is a snapshot in time. Yeah. And I remember... Um, I don't like what Menudo's doing these days either. No, yeah. I don't even... Are they still doing it? <laughs> I don't know. That would be... That's something to look into. I'm sure that if there's money in it... 30 years later. If there's money in it, they're doing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Baby Metal. Wow. Is, is another one. That's VNV funny. Nation. Love um, VNV Nation, yeah. Uh, but there's a few... And, and liter- this is literal. Like, yeah. I can roll out of bed and feel like, no, oh, there's no way I'm making anything today. I skinny put, puppy? I put on you that. No, deep I don't, puppy? No, no, they're a little too uh, retro y for me. They're, they, okay. you know, they don't. I like aggressive, like real aggressive, uh, um, structured music. Okay. And sometimes they get a little fuzzy for me. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So anyway, next time you're picking up a boxy mouse button from the That's right. I literally machine, while I was making those Christ. buttons, I was probably listening to Dude, that's hilarious. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's the duality of the wow. duality of what I do. It's Oh, I forgot to leave out I, I or I forgot to mention the most important music, which is Dillinger Four. Oh, there we go. Uh Dillinger Four is my superstition music. What where, do you mean? Um, I don't listen to it very often unless yeah. things are going bad and I've and they've got to work out. Yeah, Dillinger Four goes on. All right, literally, they're, they're your talisman. Yeah, yeah, and it rarely fails. It's the freakiest thing. Yeah, um, I've just been beside myself before with a deadline or something, and yeah, oh, 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 that's right, Dillinger Four. Put them on, and it just everything turns out right. You use them for artist block. Do you get artist block? 
You have um, like 20 different no. projects going on all if the any, time. If anything, I kind of have the opposite of artist block. <laughs> Let's just where, think of that was a dumb I question. I can't stick on a project long enough to to try to have the public view it or, yeah. or, or purchase it or consume it or whatever. Yeah. Things just too much. Then again, that's what's going on right now. Yeah. You know, it comes and goes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you can feel like you got nothing. Huh. Well, we were talking about this actually last week how you have projects that you've started and completed and never brought into the public light. I mean, day. I may you've have like I may have thing. made a post, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, hey, there's this thing I made and yeah. People are like, "Okay." It's like having 500 copies of a mega of the new magazine in your basement and you just never told anyone you made the magazine. Well, I was going to say I can imagine all that happening <laughs> except for the not telling people. I'm telling people about yeah. this one. Oh yeah. I could see having a basement with 500 unsold magazines in it. Oh no, these are going to sell. <laughs> these are going to sell. Self sabotage. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. But speaking of uh Dillinger 4 as a talisman um that kind of ties back into this idea of like the magazine being a tangible object. Do you treat art reverentially? Like I was mentioning in the second episode um, of this podcast that, you know, I, while I think of art as a religion, um, there's no sort of dogma around it or um, there's no church or cathedral. Although I think of the gallery as kind of being like a church, a sacred space, separate from the rest of the world so that the art is treated reverentially or as a sacred object. Do you have any kind of relation like that? relationship like that to other well, artwork that you like or to the work that you make well relating to my things I would say um, and I think you'll hear this from a lot of people that make stuff is uh, I'm a perfectionist mm -hmm. I, I'm and it's <laughs> not sometimes it's hard to tell why I think really what it boils down to is we get back to that um, delighting and surprising people. Mm -hmm. The more perfect it is, I feel like the more delight I'm delivering. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it comes from. And it's probably some other deeper stuff from childhood and things. But on a superficial level, I, something I'm aware of is that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about the person that has it in the end. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll be the the better I create it, the better experience it is for them. The better thing that they have. Yeah. And I don't know. You can dig in all this consumer culture and all that stuff, and I'm steeped in it. I mean, it, it, it's really weird the way I um I'm like of this weird thing where I'm creating things to sell, yet the selling part isn't important. You know what I mean? But I'm still creating consumerism I'm, sure. I'm I'm manufacturing that and it's because that's how I was brought up and and sometimes I fight against see now I'm off on this tangent but it seems like sometimes I'm fighting it mm -hmm. but when it all bought is when it, you take away everything else I'm creating these objects for other people whether yeah. it's selling it to them or it's all consumer these objects and making yeah. things and creating a product creating an object although you give quite a few of your buttons away i do pretty much anytime we're hanging out yep. and people come into the gallery that you're is like true. that's always a been a, yeah 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 you you're always right. have buttons i've given away give thousands people. of those things yeah oh yeah and with with the hope someday <laughs> that they'll buy one that they'll just be too many of them around for people to ignore me <laughs> like that's it'll the, just the saturate behind it. right the just saturation of our culture where <laughs> it's just that's how I'm gonna be undeniable is just the sheer quantity <laughs> and how many nooks and crannies these things are in yeah yeah <laughs> uh, if you had a uh, if you had a a grand plan master scheme would that be it to delight the world would it be like yes yeah yep um one button at a time i want one page flip of the magazine at a time yeah in my dreams it is it is that i want people to be aware of the things i'm making it's got nothing yeah. to do with me even though 
I found that I think in order to sell things, you need to sell yourself too. That's something I'm really bad at because I don't. I like to stay back. Mm-hmm. I like to feature the things I'm making. Well, I, that's a weird thing. It's like, you know, you'll give me crap for being idealistic because I am in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you're more real in a lot of ways. But then when it comes to actually the product of artwork. You're the idealist. I know. It's so And weird. I'm more real or practical. And that kind of, in the last conversation we had, that became so apparent. Yeah. I'm we did like a reversal. This, yeah, this weird idealist I am with all my little rules and, oh, no, don't do that. Yeah. That's that's gross. I, I use the word gross a lot when it comes to yeah selling things and marketing things. and Yeah. And I'm kind of in the marketing world a little bit, so... A lot of what I do is a retaliation against traditional marketing. So yeah, well, um, and that'll be actually. I think that that'll be the focus of an episode at some point, and I'm ho- looking forward to this conversation on it. But you know, talking about different aspects of marketing as an artist, <clears throat> and like what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's gross, what's not. Like you know, is hiring a. a "Quote unquote influencer on Instagram." Oh boy, yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've never done it. I've been tempted to. You I've know. seen somebody that I know has been doing that with one of his things he's working on. And how's it working for him? It's probably going to work great because <laughs> that's the way people do it these days. No, that's the irony. I'll you know what it. I mean? It's probably totally. going to work out just fine. Totally. Um, totally. So you just have to ask yourself, what's it all about? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, what are you in it for? Like, for instance... Can my, I ask real quick? How's that bubbly, by the way? The bubbly's good. That bubbly with carbonated water? That's yeah, good? Yeah, that's right. good. No. I've been playing it with my I can. Just, I was doing a sample. Oh, oh, that and then... Product Oh, drop. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bubbly's refreshing and tasty. <laughs> Oh, there's no. Oh, I hope someday to be at a level where there's hey, bubbly. actually like supply us beverages for our pod or for his podcast, please. Totally. Um, well, yeah, we're not what affiliated else, with anybody. What I was gonna get at? Yeah. So, and this is kind of um, little pers not personal, but okay. So you mentioned that I give away a lot of buttons. And that's been part of the plan from almost the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, It's something to do with graffiti. I don't call myself a graffiti artist because I know people that that do that kind of work and that are doing the work. Mm -hmm. Uh, What I do is a very tame version of it sometimes with all the stickering around the city and all that. But um, these buttons that I give away, that tiny little thing, that tiny little experience... I get to experience that. Sometimes it's as, sometimes it's as uh, a throw, so much of a throwaway where it's like the person doesn't quite understand why I'm giving them a button. They're suspicious. Mm-hmm. They either take it or they don't. It's not much of anything. But there's been several times where you run into a person who's having a bad day, mm-hmm. and we've always we've all had them where everything seems a little hopeless and oh today's not good and you you inject this little tiny stupid thing in their life and their their eyes light up yeah and you can tell there's a tiny little change there whether it lasts the rest of the day I don't know yeah but I get to see that that's not gross to me that's a moment you yeah. created a moment marketing is gross a lot of you're not creating a moment you're you're telling people how to feel about your product, yeah. how to use it, making ridiculous claims about it, yeah. um, deceiving people into feeling a certain way about it. Yeah, that's gross. Yeah, but that's how people do it. That's the way you yeah. you mass market a, a not a product. Yeah, I don't. I w- I want that to be right now in the life cycle of things. Right now. I'm not ready to give that up. Those yeah. moments. I'm not that's still the marketing that I'm doing. Is creating a moment at a time. Sure. Not not a million moments at a time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well and that actually that the handoff of the button too goes back to like this tangible uh 
object again. You know, this yeah. is, that moment isn't something that you can experience on Instagram. Right. It's real world. Yeah. It's real life. It's important. Yeah. Those moments are important. Yep. More so now than ever, I think. I agree. Yeah. But I don't know. What do I know? Uh, I'll probably... Then again, I'll, <clears throat> I might... The lifespan of things, this time next year, I might be totally into it. That that might be a fun part of the game for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> next year, we're going to see like Paris Hilton wearing a Boxy Mouse t-shirt. Oh, boy. <laughs> Paris, if you're listening, reach out. Right. Influ- influencers wanted. Yeah. Well, that's actually an old game, though, too. I oh, Who was it? The guy... The musician who uh, made all of his stuff on tape cassettes, and he blew up after the dude from Nirvana wore his T-shirt at what the Grammys. Was Kurt that Cobain? He had his. You know which one I'm talking about? Daniel. The black... jo- or Daniel. Uh, he just passed away. D- is he dead now? Yeah, oh, I, didn't know that. I think so. He okay would make quirky, well, pretty well crafted songs. Yeah, very sad. A lot of them were very melancholy. He had one about a motorcycle, I think. That's the guy. Yep. Yep. He just passed away recently. Okay. Um, yeah, but he blew up because you know. Yeah, organic. And I don't know that it was intentional. No, yeah, it was. That was organic. Cr- he man. liked the Kurt, guy and wore his coat. Cobain wasn't Kurt. screwing around with that crap. Yeah. And that's those are the kinds of people I look at. Yeah. And oh, you want to talk about? Doubling down on Dillinger 4. I mean, that's what they were all about. I think to the point of self-sabotage. Yeah. I think. Then again, who am I to say? But um, they were always very um, genuine. Very looking for the sellout. You know, where... And and I mean avoiding it. Looking totally. out for the sellout. <coughs> sure. Um, not wanting to participate in some of these... That's what I'm after. Genuine. Yeah. I'm after genuine. It's so hard to be truly genuine and 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 have the public at large understand what you're doing, though. Yeah. You have to tell. You do. They they sometimes they require these sorts of instructions that advertising is giving them. Sure. To let them understand what this thing is. I've always been into confusing people. I, I want to confuse people, too. I want them to look at stuff and just go, why? That's <laughs> precious, too. Yeah. Like, giving somebody a button or a sticker or something and just this not understanding what's happening. Like, why would you make these buttons? You know what I mean? Why? Yeah. It's not selling a product, per se. Yeah. You're not marketing anything but just this little character on there. Yeah. I well, you them. have a line of buttons called Nonsense Ago. Yeah, that's where that all started. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the uh, What are some of the things on those buttons? So it started out with uh, an obsession with toast. Yeah. So I had a perfect toast button. Okay. And then I think next one was Rubber Ducky, which is where the logo came from. Okay. Was the Rubber Ducky. And then... I think the next one was Tiny Monkey, which is one of my favorite. <laughs> Tiny Monkey. And then, you know, I tend to, to go animal, food, strange object. I like mix it up. So yeah. strange object would be a button that featured uh, half of it was shag carpet. Okay. And the other half was corn. <laughs> like kernels of corn. Like... You know, you'd pop, you know, like you'd serve at dinner, the kernels of corn with carpet. Yeah. So it's like that. It makes total sense. <laughs> it's, like, it's like that. But then you go back to a friend's dog. You know what I mean? This is my pal's dog. Yeah. So that's where Nonsensico started, was just these goofy buttons selling, on, selling them out of a, an extra vending machine that I had. I'm like, what am I going to sell out of this vending machine that only takes quarters instead of 50, that can only take a quarter? Yeah. Instead of 50 cents. Yeah. Well, let's do something fun and just make it 25 cents so more people play. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. More moments. And that's what I'm about. More, Exactly. More discovery. Yeah. I mean, how how cool would that be? This is exactly the kind of stuff I dig. You know, you walk into your favorite plate or your tea, your Sencha tea bar or whatever. Yeah. You're ordering your tea. Okay, I'm going to have, I know what this is. I know what my tea is. I, Oh, City Pages, I know what that is. What is that? You know what I mean? Like, what? Yeah. 
Uh, vending. Okay, those are vending machines. <laughs> Not selling gumballs or candy or cheap rubber things as I'm accustomed to. Yeah. They're buttons featuring things that I've never seen before. Yeah. And why do I like them? You know, that's the moment I want to create. Yeah. Yeah. Who uh, who are some of your inspirations? Um, well, of course, uh, there's a, an artist that goes by the name of Dalek that was very inspirational. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? Uh, well, if you want to go back, I mean, Salvador Dali, he's my favorite of all time. Ever okay. since I was a kid, that whole, the concept of surrealism. Mm-hmm. Um, along those lines, maybe is a guy like Bob Burden who did uh, Flaming Carrot comics, mm-hmm. which was really scarred me when I was a kid. Um, just he is actually somebody I might target for the magazine because his stuff is is nonsense. You know, it's so yeah. many wonderful pieces of nonsense. His stuff was never drawn fantastically, but the concepts were like nothing else. Yeah. So Bob Burden, um, I'm gonna miss so many. Dolly, the uh, probably, well, my friends. I mean, like uh, there's a graffiti guy named Biafra who's who's constantly uh, inspiring and and um, I consider him a creative counterpart sometimes. Yeah. So he inspires me and. Uh, the things that he makes and his philosophy about things. Um, I don't know. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Dalek's a big one because he... Oh, oh, and then there's uh, this dude named... Uh, how the heck does he... I think he calls himself Weeble. Yeah. But he created Weeble and Bob Okay. so many years ago. One of the first Flash animation. And you can definitely see the... The uh, the Weeble and Bob characters are definitely in Boxy Mouse a little bit. Okay. Um, just how plain they are. Yeah. But yet how much they convey. How did Boxy Mouse come about? Uh, it's a... Uh, it is... Because this is kind of your flagship. If we had to oh, name totally. like what yeah, your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if, Jay if, O'Neill's about. Yeah, if, it if anybody's heard of me, it's Mouse. mostly because of that. Yeah. Um... Or not me. If anybody's heard about the things I make, yeah, probably heard about that. Um, so I had a mouse as a pet. Uh, her name was Jasmine. Okay. And it's a caricature of her. Okay. Um, and it started out. I needed something for a double album cover, and I happened to have two mice. It's weird. I don't have mice all over the place. <laughs> I don't. It just so happens. <laughs> When you say pet, we can, was it an intentional? Pet? We can get we can get into that later. They were acquired in different ways. They were saved from a certain fate. Both of them were. Yeah. Um, but Jasmine. So Jasmine, I got from a pet store. Basil got accidentally caught out in the field by my sister, who's a mammalogist. So, okay. Um, and it was a little baby, and there's no way he would have survived. So I took him in anyway. So I had mice for a while. I had yeah. these two little mice. Basil was a little wild one. Jasmine was a little domesticated one. And I did this CD collection, and it was this Boxy Mouse character, a square character. It fit on a CD case perfect, like perfectly. Yeah. Cool. So it, I did that. It wasn't really Boxy Mouse. It was whatever it was. It was a design. Yeah. And then I had a big four-foot by four-foot canvas lying around. I'm like, you know what? I haven't painted anything in a long time. Let's just paint that thing. It could be like super poppy, super... Strange, and yeah. it was, and and from that point on, I just kind of kept on going. Okay. Learned how to um, was printing stickers almost instantly with it because I think with those CDs, I included stickers in there, and it was that character. Yeah. Um. So learned how to make stickers, learned how to make buttons, and it just kind of all snowballed. Learned okay. how to screen print. Learned how to. Well, yeah, I should say with your buttons, you're not ordering them from a manufacturer. Oh no, I'm making. You're still screening. It all. No, no, no. Some of them are. Oh, okay. They're all made by me. Yeah. Um, lots of them are conventionally digitally printed, though. Oh, okay. But there's lots of special ones out there that are screen printed. Yourself? Too. You're doing the printing yourself? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. You're not ordering them from a manufacturer. No, nope. that's always been a big part of it is the making. Okay. The making is almost important, as important as anything else. Yeah. In fact, in some ways more. I think it keeps me sane sometimes. Yeah, process, process is huge with me. Yeah. Huge. I'll pl- plug, make this one last little point. Yeah. Is um, when I started really doing this and realized and I had given it a name, it was after... This little mouse, this little jasmine, who was the the cutest little thing. Anyway, let's talk about jasmine some more. All right. So. (laughs) Join us next week for our new podcast, Jasmine. Part two. Part two. Um, So she was a little domesticated thing. It's like nothing, no other mouse I've ever seen before. Rats are kind of that way. You can get them while they'll run around on your shoulder and stuff. Yeah. This is a little mouse who did that. Yeah. And um, we could go outside. And I could just let her go out in the lawn yeah, and kind of sit cross-legged and she'd go out and kind of adventure out and then come back and hide under my leg. Yeah. So that's like a little nest Aww. and she'd go out. So we'd just hang out out in the yard. Yeah. So anyway, the, the coolest, it makes me teary when I see pictures of her. It, it's hard to explain how this little mouse means so much to me. But yeah. Um, so pretty much right after she passed away is when I... Gave it a name, um, gave it, called it Boxy Mouse, and everything. It's almost like a, it's almost like a monument to her in a way. Yeah, it's weird. Wow. Um, especially the bigger it gets, it's really weird. Its origin. So all of those moments of delight are coming back to memories of playing in the grass. Yeah, with Jasmine. oh yeah, yeah. Wow. I see a picture of her Sometimes. every once in a while, and I'm, I remember what a funny little creature she was. Yeah. So. I'm going to go out on a limb and make this observation. A lot of our conversations, in a way, we get into some dark stuff. Mm. The darker side of life. Sure. But I would almost venture to say you're an optimist. Especially after hearing a story like that. Like, you see the beauty in the world. And then that leads to you propagating the beauty in the world through all of your projects and these little moments. I would say that's only possible if you're an optimist. And okay. see the, and see the. <laughs> you're like, yeah, no. <laughs> no, I believe in that. I believe that. Yeah. There's there's something in there. Okay. When I'm, um, when I'm doing what I do, which is either making stuff or talking to other people that make stuff, that's my best self. Yeah. So there is optimism in there. This this whatever this is that I do, it's it's my best. It's the best I have to give. Yeah. You know, day job, not really. Uh, other parts of life, not as much. Yeah. But I, you can feel it. When when I'm, when I'm you're doing it, you know this is what you're here to do. Yeah. And when I'm doing it, it's like, it's rare. It's, yeah. It's a rare place to be where it's like, yep, not a whole lot of other people are doing exactly this. Yep. Um, that goes into, you know, again... Um, to tie it back to the art as religion I kind of think of being an artist as being a vocation or you're called to do it as opposed to a career or a job or right you know it's a calling it's right as long as you are actively um cultivating that Mm -hmm. and not sitting back here's one of the reasons why I get so cynical when people talk about art Mm-hmm. and artists and making art and artistic and if you get in the business of describing your art you're not making anything it's like what do you mean <sighs> okay so I think I think and we're doing it right now that's what's so ironic but <laughs> if you're doing what we're doing if right you're doing now exactly what we're doing that's probably not a great thing um <laughs> which is talking about it yeah talking about it and talking in a very like mm, you know mm, i'm an artist and yeah I'm, I'm just gonna sit here and be an artist and talk about my stuff no you gotta be making stuff you yeah. gotta be pushing it and refining defining what you're doing and refining that and continuing that cycle of definition and refining getting better yeah delighting better 
No, that makes sense. That makes sense. You know what I mean? I mean, you, oh, yeah. you, you, if you're around enough, you, you know, people that like to talk about it, but what are you really working on? What Talking about, oh, I'm an artist. I've never seen any of your work. Every Everything I've seen on Instagram is you standing in front of something that you painted. <laughs> I can't see it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree entirely. In fact, you know, I think that the, it's a common thing for a lot of artists to not like critics for that reason. You know, what are you doing talking about art? Right. You can't talk about uh, art same with or artist casters. statements. Sports, you can talk about it with any uh, anything. Again, I try to make the things I do speak for me. Mm-hmm. This, th- and again, we're going to touch on the magazine uh, uh, it's going to be released on the 2nd of February. <laughs> um, <laughs> as long as we're talking about it. Yeah. It's a reaction to that. Yeah. It's just getting out of the way. No words, no yeah. nothing. Just these are the things, man. You either yeah. you either get it or you don't. If you yeah. get it, look in the back and find the artist that you like and go find more. Totally. And then you'll be able to fill in the cracks of the story. Because we totally. like that story too. Everybody does. I mean... You want to know, like, for like my relationship with you, if mm-hmm. if if we didn't have the relationship that we did, I'd still like your artwork because I think it's great. Mm-hmm. But this understanding of each other is where it's at. Yeah, you know, you can't completely eliminate that because there's yeah. beauty in that too. Understanding yeah. where somebody's coming from is so important as well. Well, that was kind of a hurdle I had to jump over myself too with this podcast like in the first episode I kind of talked I mentioned that briefly where you know words can't do justice to experiencing artwork Um, and then ironically here I'm sitting on a mic trying to talk about art it's like wow it's pretty ironic that's hypocritical yeah I just realized (laughs) it was so funny when I was getting into that people talking about artwork I'm like wait a minute that's exactly what we're doing But but then yeah and that was a hurdle that it's kept me actually to be honest from doing this for a long time because it is like who am i to talk about it for one thing everything i have to say is on the on the wall you know either right. in one of my frames or in somebody that i'm showing and displaying you know that's what i think about art to come to the gallery look at what's on the wall mm-hmm. um who am i to sit at a microphone but now i'm entering this new phase where it's like well No, I want to promote. I want to promote not just other artists, um, but I want to promote art, the capital A. You know, I want to promote the capital creative principle concept of like, you know, what the value of art is to our life because I see it as a a means to making our everyday world a better place. Like you were saying, moments of delight. I think that's, that's my mission with this podcast and really I think what the mission of my artwork's been and the artwork that I show here at the gallery has been, you know, I can't say, look at a painting. Do you get what I'm right. getting from it? So I'm trying to put words to that stuff now. Um, but it was a big hurdle to get over, you know, turning the mic on and then just start talking. Mm-hmm. So, well, I think that's a good place to uh, end our blathering for this, our first conversation on Rogue Buddhism. Uh, I want to thank you, Jay, for coming into the studio and chit-chatting with me. Always a pleasure talking to you, sir. Hopefully this is just the first of many conversations where we dig deep into this thing called art. That was once again Jay O'Neill of Boxy Mouse and now Nonsensico Digest fame. You can find him at BoxyMouse.com or follow him on Instagram at Boxy Mouse. I really appreciated the time he spent here in studio and I look forward to more conversations in the near future and also learning more about baby metal. Before we go, as promised, I have an art event I'd like to share with you that's opening this weekend. Kindred Folk Illustrative Paintings by DC Ice opens Saturday, February 29th from 7 until 10 p.m. at Gallery 360, a rogue Buddha gallery and Nicholas Harper favorite.
Gallery 360 welcomes back local talent DC Ice, also a rogue Buddha favorite, with an exhibition steeped in anthropomorphic reverie entitled Kindred Folk. Ice is revered by many for her visually storied and highly illustrative works that are carved and painted on scratchboard. Off the wall and always original, Ice's artwork never fails to delight and amuse even the most discriminating art devotees. You can find out more details about this exhibit, again, opening Saturday, February 29th from 7 to 10 p.m. at Gallery 360, and all of the wonderful art events taking place this weekend at mplsart.com. That's mplsart.com. They have a passion for sharing the talents of our fair twin cities like none other, and their director of galleries and events, it's unsurpassed, so be sure to check out mplsart.com. And that's a wrap for this episode of Art Wonderful, coming to you from deep inside the Rogue Buddha Gallery. I want to thank you for joining me, and I hope you do so again and often. Until next time, remember, the best life is the creative life, and the best self is the artistic self. Cheers. Craft a curated a collection. Yeah. You should know all these words, man. <laughs> you, the gallery owner, you should know all the fancy phrases. Oh, yeah. I'm going to cut that one out. Yeah. No, we got to keep that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.